Well, good evening. I'm John Jackson, the coordinator for the college's evening lecture series, and it's my pleasure to serve as master of ceremonies for this very special event. Our guest speaker tonight is a highly accomplished naval officer, aviator, and record-setting astronaut. Most of you have probably read her biography, so I'll save time by simply mentioning a few of her highlights. Sunita Lynn Williams is the youngest of three children born to an Indian American father and a Slovenian American mother. She grew up outside Boston, Massachusetts and graduated from the US Naval Academy in May of 1987. She earned her wings of gold as a Navy helicopter pilot in 1989 and logged more than 3,000 flight hours in more than 30 aircraft types. Longing to fly higher and faster, she was selected as a NASA astronaut in 1998. Her first long duration space flight began in December 2006 when she flew aboard the Space Shuttle Discovery to the International Space Station. During the 192 days of this mission, she conducted three spacewalks outside the station. She next flew into space in July 2012 aboard a Russian Soyuz space launch, spacecraft launching from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. During this expedition, she became commander of the International Space Station, only the second woman in history to achieve this feat. She also completed four additional spacewalks, bringing her total time outside the ISS to nearly 51 hours. In November 2012, she returned to Earth in the Soyuz capsule, bringing her cumulative flight record to over 321 days in orbit. Looking ahead, Sunny will return to space aboard yet a third type of spacecraft, the Boeing-built Starliner, which will launch from Kennedy Space Center in April of this year. In addition to her many military decorations and awards, I'd like to note that she received the Padma Bhushan Medal from the Republic of India, the nation's third highest award for merit, which is very rarely given to non-Indian citizens. I'd now like to turn the podium over to the 57th president of the Naval War College, Rear Admiral Shoshana Chatfield, to speak about her former classmate. Thank you, Professor Jackson. Well, good evening. good evening. I'm delighted to be here, and I'd like to uh, just give a warm welcome to all of our attendees this evening, our CNO Distinguished International Fellows, our other flag and general officers in the audience today, our deans, our faculty, our students and our staff, and our family members who have joined us this evening. Thank you so much for coming. I want to start by saying that in the summer of 1984, in about 105 degree heat in Charleston, South Carolina, I met Sunita Pandya, who was really locked on, I would have to say. I was at Boston University as an NROTC student, and Sunny seemed to know everything about the Navy to me. Uh, she seemed pretty far advanced. And I thought, wow, I hope I get to have as much knowledge about the Navy as she does, and I hope that I'm gonna be as good an officer as she will be. I knew it then. And our paths intersected again at the first course of instruction at Navy Flight School. And again, I knew from the jump wings on her chest and the dive wings on her chest that this incredibly gifted officer was going to go far, and I wanted to be just like her. She got winged ahead of me. She flew the H-46, which I desperately wanted to fly, and subsequently did get to fly. And you know, I was reminded of this um, being inspired. And uh, when we look around at the people we work with, it's this kind of inspiration that keeps us in, whether it's the small team aspect of being in service or in this profession of arms, or whether it's just encountering people who have such capacity. And we're inspired. 
We recently had the Commandant of the Marine Corps on this stage, but in the office call beforehand, he was talking about Lieutenant Colonel Mann, who is a Marine Corps officer and who is now flying for NASA, an astronaut. And he said, how do we remind people that she's a Marine like us? And I said, oh, you don't have to remind us. We know who our astronauts are. I said, it's the kids. It's the kids in elementary school and middle school who really need to be reminded that this path is open. And math is fun. Sonny studied math. I was a French major. And stu Sonny, Sonny studied math. Math and science are fun. And studying those subjects and being part of history and doing things that become part of the human record on this planet are inspirational to us. So it is just my distinct honor to welcome to the stage my friend, Captain Retired Sonny Williams. Thank you so much. Ooh. Good evening, everyone. Shoshana, thank you. Sorry, I'm Admiral. We've known each other for a long time, so I, I have this, uh, I, you know, I have a hard time. Wow, she's an admiral, holy crap. Like, my husband is also a helicopter pilot, went through flight school with us as well, and uh, I said, look at Sho's house, it's amazing. <laughs> Honestly, it's just a pleasure to be here with everybody tonight. Um, we all have amazing careers. I got the pleasure to talk to a bunch of people over at the house uh, earlier today, and it's just amazing what you guys are doing, what you're going through, commands that you're going to take. It's really, really exciting. Uh, my path maybe was just a little bit different. Uh, I was telling a story earlier when we were um, in the H-46 FRS, the Fleet Replacement Squadron, getting ready to learn how to fly this this aircraft, it was sort of interesting because at that point in time, women were just being allowed in combat, and one of our classmates uh, was, I was pre-flighting the aircraft with my instructor, and one of our classmates was sitting there, um, or I'm sorry, she was pre-flighting with her instructor, and they had a news crew there, and I'm walking out to my aircraft to go do the same thing, and I hear her stop and say, Command at sea, that's what it's all about and for the news crew. And I was thinking to myself at that time, I was like, I'm five years and out. I don't really have a future in the Navy. I like what I'm doing. This is fun. But I would like to have kids and have a family and go get out. And I recognized at that time, wow, there is actually opportunities for women. I didn't really, really get it until I actually heard her, and I didn't take it seriously at first, but then I, I thought about it later. I was like, wow, there's, there's really opportunities. So my husband and I continue on, and one thing led to another. And I love being in the Navy. I love that career. Uh, I stumbled upon, I was mentioning earlier, I sort of stumbled upon this career as an astronaut. I'll, I'll talk about it later if you, you all would like to hear about that, but it's just another branch. It's something else that you can do that's, prof that's a profession. You know, it's just something else, but what you guys are doing here at the War College is you, what you're learning here, the friendships you're making, that connection is really what's gonna take us all into the future, that good relationship. So I, I, um, I'm very honored to be here with all of you, first and foremost, um, and secondly, I think I should talk about space, huh? Maybe a little bit, so I'll get on with that. So um, what I wanted to talk about is what, what we've been doing and where we're going, because maybe that has not really been on everybody's forefront here, but I'd love to share it with you, and I'd love to hopefully make it seem like it's important to you as well. So we have a path, um, a plan, a strategy, you might say, about what we're doing. This is what we, I would call a blueprint for our exploration in science, our exploration of the solar system. Um, putting science at the forefront of it all, why? Because it helps us as humanity. For the United States, 
We'd like to be the leaders in space, and I'll talk to that in a little bit, but that is what we'd like to do. So it's a cool little diagram, very spacey. I like it, right? Um, it shows things that we've done and things that we would like to do, going from your left to your right. Uh, I will, wanted to talk about a couple things in this diagram. Of course, we had the Hubble Space Telescope, and we have James Webb Space Telescope. Um, we have the International Space Station, uh, which was something that I thought could never happen. Sort of like when I was on that flight line. A career in the Navy? Really? Could the space station ever really happen? This is what I was told was going to happen when I got to NASA in 1998. This is Mr. Potato Head. Does this thing really actually get put together? This is a crazy idea. How could we put, be putting all these modules together? How could we be putting these solar rays on? Changing the way it looks as it's being built. Have people live in it while it's being built? I thought, there's just no way. It's a nice dream. Maybe we'll try and do it. It's a nice dream. Maybe we'll, it's a good, gives the space shuttle program good purpose. We'll try and do these types of things. Now, unbeknownst to me, because I got there in 98, for about a decade beforehand, there was a lot of work that was going on, a lot of work to make those agreements, those arrangements, to come up with a reason why we should build the space station. And the reason, really, that it got passed in Congress was by one vote, because we involved our Russian partners. That's really why we had the International Space Station. Five agencies involved, of course, NASA, Roscosmos, ESA, um, Canada and JAXA, and we all get together, but it wasn't until we got the Russians on board that the, the space station was approved. So the beginning of the space station, like I said, was just two, was just a couple modules put up in space, one launched on a proton rocket and one from the space shuttle brought up node one. Those two pieces were mated in space and the space station was born. It wasn't until we got a solar array on top from the very beginning of this that we actually launched the first crew. They needed to have power. And on that crew's first crew was Bill Shepard, was going to be the commander of the space station, Yuri Gazenko, and Sergei Krikalov. I don't know if you'll remember those names. It's not important. But I know them all. They're my friends. And that's pretty cool. It's about relationships. Um, Bill Shepard is a SEAL. Any of those out there? They're a pretty cool group of people. But uh, Sergei Krikalov still works for Roscosmos, and uh, Yuri Gagarin, I mean, um, Yuri Gazenko had just retired from, uh, Roscos from GCTC, the Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center. Um, so how did, else did we build this? Like I mentioned, there's one thing about having an international partner that you're working with an international partner. You put maybe somebody in the critical path. That causes potentially some headaches. The Russians were in our critical path of building the space station. We needed them to put their modules up before we could put all, our, all of ours up. So some of our modules were waiting in the space station processing facility in Florida, waiting for shuttles to take them up, waiting for the robotic, the Canadian robotic arm to install them on the space station. All that was get going on, getting ready, ready to go. So that's actually how we built our portion, the European portion, and the Japanese portion with the Canadian arm and the American space shuttles taking up the pieces that were going up there. I didn't really believe it until I got to go. I was on uh, a space shuttle in t end of 2006. Uh, there was a little delay there um, because of the Columbia accident that happened in the beginning of 2003. So it took a little while for us to get the program back to really understand exactly what had happened to the shuttle, make sure we had fixed as much as we can, made sure we knew how to inspect as well as we can to make sure all these shuttles would come home safely. It was a, it was a promise to our astronaut corps that we would get to the bottom of the, of, the, of the accident and make sure we would never have that happen again. So I got to go up in 2006. It was in the middle of the construction of the space station. The solar rays weren't nicely on the edge. There was one on the top and one sort of on the side, a little uneven. Actually, the solar wind would blow us a little bit out of um, our normal configuration, and we'd sort of turn, so the, uh, the gyros had to pull us back, and the, uh, the Russian thrusters had to pull us back during that time frame because it wasn't evenly balanced. Pretty, pretty wild time frame. But we kept going with this, knowing that at some point in time we were going to have to retire the space shuttle. We only had so many flights that we were guaranteed for to make sure 
that the space station was built and our obligations to our international partners, our friends, we would uphold them with the shuttle flights. So then in 2011, it took us like a decade to build the space station. We, it was the last flight of the space shuttle and we ended our major construction of the big pieces and it was complete for the most part. I say for the most part because I, there's more to, more to come. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but we still had to go to the space station. We had obligations to our partners to maintain this thing until at least 2020, and now pushing 2024 and possibly up to 2030. So we'll, we'll see what happens. But right now we have obligations from all our partners to stay up there until 2024. So how did we keep flying to the space station? Once again, we call on our partners, right? Our Russian partners. My second flight, I got to go up with as m one of many others also who got to go up with the Russians on a Russian Soyuz spacecraft that launched out of Kazakhstan um, in a town called Baikonur, which has been historic, the historic launch pad where Yuri Gagarin launched from, and many, many more. But they fulfilled the obligation every six months taking people up to the International Space Station. And that was a really fun flight because finally the space station was in its final config and everything was configuration and everything was in line. All the laboratories were up there. We had an American laboratory, Destiny. We had the Japanese laboratory. We had a European laboratory. We had all sorts of science experiments happening. We had commercial companies sending up science experiments. We had universities. We had elementary schools and high schools all sending up science experiments that we were doing on the space station, not to mention we're testing out the materials. It's already been about 10 years. People have been living on the space station continuously since 2000, Halloween 2000, essentially. Oh, November 2nd, they launched on Halloween. And so we were like humans up there, right? Smelling up the space station. So we got to do all of our own cleaning, our own fixing, our own changing of everything up there. And so things start to break. Things start to sort of get a little bit old. And we have to go out and do spacewalks to fix the things. We have all sorts of supplies that we the final shuttle took up on the outside of the space station and on the inside so we can maintain it for a number of years. So at the end, um, so even today, sorry, you want to just bring up the space station real quickly. Why do I have two views? Can you tell? One's from the front, one's from the back. Um, just wanted to show you a little bit. The one on your left is the back side. That's where all the Russian pieces are. The one on the front is looking straight at us as, as though it's flying right at you. If you look at the one, the picture on the right, the solar rays on the far right looks a little funny, right? There's a little extra solar rays. So in the last 15 years, we have become a little bit smarter on technology, solar ray technology. So we're adding on now brand new solar rays to the, to the existing solar rays that have the capacity much greater than the huge ones that are out there. This is a technology experiment as well as pr providing power to the International Space Station. And just as we were getting ready to have uh, um, dinner over at Admiral Chatfield's house, they were just finishing up a spacewalk, putting on another one of those extra solar rays. Uh, folks just finished this afternoon. So it's still ongoing. I'm going to bring us back to what our plan is, right? So this guy is flying, like we all know. We saw how it was constructed. We saw the partnerships that led to this construction. There's more partnerships. The next thing I would like to talk about is in the lower part of the screen is commercial crew. So th this next venture started somewhere when we knew that the space shuttle was ending. We knew that we, would, we had this great partnership with the Russians, but we also wanted to fulfill our obligation to fly um, their cosmonauts as well as our astronauts up from US soil. So we started a program called commercial crew. NASA's in the business of exploration. We want to provide low Earth orbit for folks that would like to take it up. So we put out a contract for folks who wanted to make a spacecraft to go to low Earth orbit. Now remember I mentioned there was five agencies, like countries or multiple countries that built the International Space Station. Now I'm talking about industry. So in the United States, there's a number of companies that are interested in space at this time. Remember I talked about the solar array and think about the technology that went from the very beginning of the space station to now to make that solar array so much smaller. Think about how companies have advanced in um, engineering, um, manufacturing process as well as software that they can themselves go to space. And I know you've probably heard of SpaceX. I know you've heard of Boeing. You've probably heard of Sierra Nevada. You've probably heard of Virgin Galactic. 
a Blue Origin, a bunch of companies out there that now can take that technology in-house and make their own rockets and own spacecraft and go to space. So NASA ended up awarding Boeing and SpaceX the contract to take astronauts to space somewhere around 2015. I'm, you'll, you have to, I, don't quote me on the, the dates and stuff like that exactly, but I got involved in 2015. I think that's why it leaves an impression on me. I got involved around 2015. Um, me and a couple other folks in the office who had flown a couple times, had a, couple, a little bit of experience, some on Soyuz, some on Space Shuttle, uh, were part of what we call a cadre, and we got together and were able to go to both companies and see what they were doing. NASA provided these companies only the requirements, and they said, you're on your own, go ahead, go build it, figure it out, we want to take people up and down to the International Space Station on a regular basis. I'll give you, a, the next thing is a little bit of a, next slide is a video to show a little bit about some of the work that we had the privilege of doing. We've had the opportunity uh, to try on the suits, to sit in the seats, to interact with the displays, the emergency egress systems for uh, any type of uh, emergency egress from the pad. It's been pretty fun, actually, uh, checking out all the hardware. Because NASA has not done a flight test program for a spaceship since the space shuttle. So you're talking late 70s, early 80s, the last time we, we kind of did this as an agency. So some of it is kind of relearning those techniques and those things that you need to make sure you're watching out for. We'll be uh, brushing up on all the uh, long duration space flight tasks that we've uh, trained for over the years, including spacewalking and robotics and all the space station systems. But then we're gonna learn all about the new vehicle, all about our suits, how we're gonna operate in that vehicle, emergency procedures. You're going to have kind of this uh, hybrid, if you will, for these first flights where you're helping develop things and at the same time you're getting training. We're going to be building what it is the crew member needs to know. Things that are really neat to me that, that are new is, is putting on a new spaceship, you know, putting your arms into it and actually getting to touch the screens, you know, just like you did as an operator when you're going into space. So those skills that we honed in test pilot school and then later on as test pilots, uh, I think they're going to be put to use in flying these vehicles. It's a new set of hardware and it's a new set of software. So for all the folks that are following along uh, throughout the world, I, I really would like them to recognize that there's a huge team that makes this possible, that when I get the opportunity to board one of these spacecraft and fly into space, that I will have been propped up by a team of engineers that made this happen. So engineers speak. <laughs> Math and, and science, it's sort of fun. Do you believe me? <laughs> OK, just checking. <laughs> it is fun. Math is fun. Physics are fun. You can use those principles to actually create a spacecraft. To understand how a spacecraft works is using those principles that you learn in college, in advanced uh, you know, engineering school. And it's what companies do. So the two that were awarded, like I mentioned already, Boeing and SpaceX. I think everybody thought, hey, Boeing's got a long history in space travel. They built a large, a large part of the International Space Station. They have other, you know, space and missile defense. They have all sorts of things that they're doing. You know, this is a sure bet. Um, this was a pretty genius on, some, on the part of the leadership at NASA. But why don't we offer it to somebody else, too, just to see how they solve the problem. Again, remember I mentioned that we gave them requirements. We didn't tell them how to do it. All we did was give them requirements, said, build us a spacecraft that will go back and forth to the International Space Station. And the one that came out first across the finish line is this one right here, which is a Falcon 9 and a dragon sitting on top. You probably all heard of SpaceX by now, right? They're on their fifth crew up to the International Space Station, the people I was talking about earlier, one of them was on that crew, and uh, Nicole Mann is also the, the commander of the spacecraft that went up there just recently, Crew 5. So this is their Falcon 9, the first flight uh, with people, Demo 2 it was called, uh, going up to the International Space Station. Endeavour, this is Houston. You've completed a historic ride to the ISS and have opened up a new chapter in human space exploration. You probably recognized two of the guys from that first video. Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley were the, the test pilots on that spacecraft. But since then, like I mentioned, we're up to crew five, so it's pretty impressive. So demo two, one, two, three, four, five. 
um, plus a couple others, which I'll talk about in a second. But in the meantime, uh, Boeing is, was working on their spacecraft called the Starliner. Uh, it's the one that actually I'm scheduled to go fly on. We've had some fits and starts with this spacecraft. Uh, Boeing is a really great hardware company. This, this spacecraft is solid. It lands a little differently than, uh, than Dragon. Dragon lands in the water, um, and then a recovery ship comes and picks up the capsule. Uh, Starliner will land on land, so it has landing airbags. I've seen two of them land, one in person and one uh, in the control center, watching the second one land. Uh, we had two unmanned flights of Starliner already before we do one with people. Dragon only had one unmanned one. The reason is we had a little bit of a problem with software on the first one. And the spacecraft, when it got to space, didn't know where it was exactly. It thought it was a lot further in the mission. The mission control team was able to interact with control, with commands from Houston, and was able to get the spacecraft in a safe orbit and then bring it back but it didn't complete its mission to go to the International Space Station. Boeing recognized this and decided, hey, we need to do a second test flight to prove to our customer, which is NASA, that we actually can do this, have faith in the spacecraft, and it's going to make it to the space station. We had a pretty flawless flight this past May, and that opens the door for people to now start flying this spacecraft. Pretty amazing. Now, software and automation is a, is a new territory for the space industry. I would say uh, we sort of lead the way in a lot of things, but there's a lot of trust that needs to be put into the software and automation. I was talking; we were talking earlier at a roundtable a little slightly about this. And when is it when is it enough? Like, when is it going to be okay where we can just sit back and let something drive for you or let something fly for you after you've done enough testing, enough regression testing, enough testing on the software? Maybe there's different ways you need to test the software to make sure if you're going to make a change, it's not going to interrupt something else. This is a big deal for the industry. Rockets are dangerous, so we have to make sure we get it right. In spacecraft, where the, that environment's a little dangerous, we just have to make sure we get it right. So knock on wood, hopefully I'll see you in space in April. We're not done yet, though. <laughs> Next, um, I quickly wanted to talk about SpaceX's journey and um, hopefully the mission for, for Starliner as well. There's a lot of people on the space station right here. Granted, the space station's like the size of a, like a 737, you know, the, the whole tube. You can push off one end and it takes about 30 seconds to fly to the other end. So it's, it's, it's big and roomy, but we'd like to take a picture all together. So in this picture, there's a SpaceX crew, um, crew three, as a matter of fact. Uh, Kayla Barron, who's a Navy submariner, is up, upside down up top, as a matter of fact. Uh, also a Soyuz crew. That's a crew of three. And then there's another Dragon crew, which are the guys in the middle there. And that is a commercial company called Axiom. Axiom has customers that come to them, and they take people up in space. On this, and they take them on a Dragon spacecraft, and they are taking them to the International Space Station. So Axiom 1 uh, has one experienced astronaut, but now is a private astronaut. The guy in the far right, Mike Lopez Alegria, he's a P3 pilot, former pilot. Actually, I did my uh, did three spacewalks with him on one of my missions earlier. But now he's a commercial astronaut taking up people who pay for the flight. So this is what I was talking about: commercialism in low Earth orbit. This that part where people are paying to go to space is not what NASA is about. NASA is about exploration. We've opened the door for that commercialization of space for other companies to take that over, which is pretty cool. Axiom is actually going to put another module on top, on the front of the space station for their flying and paying customers in the future as well. So it's moving. People, when I was, when I was flying my shuttle flight, we had our first um, paying customers go up on a Russian Soyuz, and everybody was like, oh, this is terrible. These guys come to the space station, which was not meant for tourism, and they're flying around. They're making a mess of the place. We've got to watch what they're doing, blah, blah, blah. And we didn't all take it seriously. That was in, like, 2008 time frame. And now we are sending spacecraft specifically with tourists or paying customers who are going to do science up on the space station. Times have changed, and they've changed quickly, very, very quickly. So we'll go back again to my diagram, because <laughs> we have to keep going back to where we are, right? So we've talked about um, International Space Station. We've talked about commercial crew. And the next thing on the line, of course, 
is the moon. So why, of course, are we going to the moon, right? That's a, that's a question a lot of people ask. Could it be economic? Could it be political? Why are we going to the moon? Is it just because we are going to someplace cool and we want to put more people on the moon? You know, we've been to the moon before, so some argued like, oh, this is, why are we doing it? We've already done it. We went, we landed, we put boots there, we collected rocks, we came home. Have we, have we done it all? Well, not necessarily. The moon is a cool place. There's lots of things that we've learned over these years since the Apollo program to make us want to go back, to make us want to maybe find some ice, to make us want to go and figure out how we would actually live and work there. We've built this international space station, we've lived and worked there, so why can't we move, live and work on some place that has a little gravity? It seems like it's pretty doable, actually, at this juncture. Maybe a little while ago, it didn't seem like it, it was it was even achievable that we would actually go and live there. But now, it's getting to be that point where we actually can maybe do this. There's a little difference if you notice these numbers here between the moon and Mars though, right? And if we just go straight to Mars, um, it's far. It's really far. Like, like, I don't know if we'd get home, right, right now. So um, why don't we start close to home, figure out how to go and live and work there, figure out how to go and come back and make sure the next generation of space explorers will be safe when they get to Mars and then they could come back. And I don't know, do you all know that um, uh, uh, Artemis is supposed to launch tonight? Do you guys know that? One in the morning is about a two hour launch window. Last I read, I didn't look at my email since we're at the house, but last I read it was all go, so I think, I think we might be going tonight. Unmanned, but we, I think we're going to go. We're going to the moon to explore, and we're going to the moon for scientific discovery. Our destiny is always to go and see what's further and what's next. The moon is a stepping stone, and the moon is a place we need to learn how to live so that we can continue to go beyond. We are focused. We are focused on all that lies before us. Only together will we bring to life this global ambition of returning to the moon. And while our work is far from finished, we've never been closer to seeing a new generation step beyond our home planet. We are building on the achievements of those who came before. The giants who conquered gravity and raised a banner in the heavens, they beckon us to go farther, to the moon and on to Mars, to seek a deeper understanding of our universe and bring all that we learn home. The daily efforts of thousands of suppliers from all across this country and around the world fed into stunning milestones and laid the groundwork for history. Launch team, go. Artemis has been woven into our culture. It has fostered collaboration across the aisles and across the ponds. It has grown beyond plans and preparations to include hardware and software, and now, it has a heartbeat. You can feel the momentum. It is undeniable. We are going. And together, we will see Artemis light the way. We are going to the moon to learn how to live on other planets for the benefit of all. Let's go. To put it a little bit more in words, you know, the, like I mentioned, the, the moon is a natural stepping stone, right? So we gotta go there, figure it out, and then we can go on a little further. I quickly mentioned already about ice and water, and water means potential life, not necessarily on the moon, but a sustainable life for us if we can use that water or find that water in the regolith that's, that's there. It's resources that we'll have when we get there. So it's actually becoming, like I mentioned, a possibility. We could all get there with keeping, like I mentioned in the beginning, science in the forefront. So we, to get there is one thing, to do science is another thing, and to live there and continually do science is, is, a, is a whole other thing. So we're getting there. It's part of our strategic plan, like I mentioned, to hopefully go to the moon and then go on from there. So I quickly mentioned Artemis 1. Artemis 1 is poised to go fly tonight. Hopefully it does. 
And it will go back to the moon, the first spacecraft to actually go back to the moon, actually go farther than the Apollo program because it will be in an elliptical, go in an elliptical orbit around the moon and then eventually come back. Um, it's pretty exciting to actually see all that hardware, which you saw in the video, actually get stacked up together. I've seen it in pieces throughout the last couple of years. All of us have been part of the building of Orion in whatever form or fashion, the cockpit, the displays, the seats, and then actually see pieces and parts all get put together and see it on the launch pad, it's pretty amazing. So that's bigger, slightly bigger. I think it's like one foot bigger than the Saturn V rocket. So uh, lucky people who are down there are going to go hopefully watch it. I almost wanted to jump in it, but it doesn't have any environmental control systems, so it might be a little bit hard to breathe. So that's not a good one for people quite yet. But it's going. And then a couple years later, hopefully we'll launch Artemis II, and this one will have people on it. We'll have four people on it, more than likely some of our international partners on board with it. Um, it will be, like I mentioned, the first flight of people on this spacecraft. It should happen in a couple of years, no earlier than uh, 2024. Um, and it will go, again, on an SLS space launch system rocket and to the moon. It will not land on the moon. It will go to the moon, to the vicinity of the moon. Then there's Artemis III, which will go a couple of years later and hopefully put the first two people on the moon and Artemis, this is a very complex uh, architecture, but it's out there. It's written down. People are planning on it, working on it. Artemis III will need not only an o SLS Orion spacecraft, but also an HLS, human landing system. And this was also a contract. Two flights were awarded to SpaceX to build this uh, lander, uh, where we'll have two people that will come from Orion, transfer over to uh, an uh, HLS and then go land on the moon. So why? I think we talked about a little bit about this earlier. Also, maybe the architecture will change. This seems like a lot, right? It seems like, wow, how are you going to do this? How are you going to put all these rockets and pieces and parts and space and transfer and all this kind of stuff? It's not, it's, and that's not even it. We have another thing called Gateway, which is on the horizon also, building another space station in the vicinity of the moon that will have a lander on Gateway that will go up and down to the moon and back. It seems super complicated to, to me. Does it seem complicated to you? Yeah, and it's confusing, right? But there is, a, like I mentioned, an architecture laid out there and stated that we're going to do all these things. And I was amazed when I started seeing uh, SLS Artemis hardware put together. I was amazed when I got to go to the rollout and see this huge rocket roll by. It actually happens. Again, I was amazed when the International Space Station really got all put together. I was amazed when I flew down to um, Boca Chica, you know where that is, South Texas, Brownsville, and there's a bunch of these Starship mock-ups, test articles all lined up, and a huge building with the, where the booster is that they just tested yesterday, if anybody's following SpaceX, 14 Raptor engines all lit 10 seconds. It seems impossible, but it's happening. And then, I think somebody else may, a couple people in this audience might be able to live potentially on the moon and then tell your kids how to go to Mars. So this is going to happen eventually. We're getting there. We're working not only on all these rockets and spacecraft, but what these people are wearing. All of the spacesuit work is also going on. Contracts to um, spacesuit companies, a bunch of them, Two contracts were awarded for spacesuits, for space walking suits, moon walking suits. It's all happening. I've been in the prototype spacesuit uh, when we just started doing this again to actually walk around, bend down, kneel, stand up. It's, it's hard to do in a very heavy suit, but we've started to put all that in motion. It's all happening. So what's the bottom line? Everything is possible. Just got to believe in it. Thank you. Well, I really appreciate uh, Sonny arranging to have that rocket launched tonight uh, in conjunction with this event. It's it was, crazy. There's a lot of scheduling that went into that and whatnot. 
Uh, before we go to questions, uh, Amy, would you bring your daughter up on stage? And when you talk about the next generation and whatnot, this is who we're talking about. And I think she's just an absolute marvelous example. And I think a good picture with, uh, with Sonny. Okay. Thumbs up. You got it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Couple last comments. Uh, first, uh, Sunny has uh, invited us all to a uh, Artemis watch party in her <laughs> hotel room uh, this evening. So you'll have to get the uh, information from her as to where she's staying. <laughs> Uh, second, uh, after we finish here, uh, Sonny's going to go out in the lobby if you got an opportunity to uh, meet with her and, and take some photos and whatnot. On your way out, you will find uh, uh, an array of uh, small space capsules, something which is known as uh, uh, astronaut blue squishies. squishies. We've got 400 of those, Good and we've arm. got Four stickers guys. for her, our, her uh, flight coming up, so please help yourself as you exit this, uh, this evening. And to wrap things up, I'd like to invite uh, uh, Admiral Chatfield to boldly go where everyone has gone before. So. <laughs> Should I sit down? Yeah, stay there. Oh, stay here? Yeah, stay here. Okay, okay. okay. Yeah, so, um, dear attendees, isn't it amazing to hear the story of exploration? We often are just caught up in our war college world of thinking about space as part of all domain warfare. But this aspect of space, this exploration, is the development of evolution of thinking about how we exist and how we can move forward. And I think about these technologies which were so carefully held by governments. Uh, space is one of these technologies and how this has evolved to be a business and to move faster. And we're in an, a world in which these technologies are accelerating and the impacts on us mm -hmm. are quite profound. And being able to absorb this change is part of our human experience. And so thank you for being an interpreter for us about what it means to be able to live and work so far from home as a human and what we're learning about that. Dear guests, please join me in a round of applause for Captain Williams. Okay, we're going to take one more picture. Captain, can you bring your daughter up? And I don't know if we have any more um, younger generation here, but I, I think maybe um, getting a photo here uh, with this backdrop will be uh, probably preferable to the lobby. <laughs> So when do the real old guys get to get up there? I don't know. Okay, we're going to, uh, uh, the Admiral and Sonny are going to sneak out through the green room and whatnot so we don't get trapped up here, but she'll be moving around to the backside near the Iwo Jima Memorial, and uh, we'll do some photos there. So thank you very much for coming.